welcome to She Thinks, a podcast where you're allowed to think for yourself. I'm your host, Beverly Hallberg, and on today's episode, we look at the increasing crime rates across the country and ask the important question of, can law and order be restored in our cities? Well, Heather McDonald joins us to break down the data, explain why violent criminals are let back on the street so quickly, and what, if any, are the solutions we have to combat the unsafe conditions many people are living in. We're also going to discuss her recent book that looks at the importance of evaluating people on merit and instead of race. And as we jump into the conversation, a little bit more about Heather. She is the Thomas W. Smith Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a contributing editor, editor at City Journal. Her work has covered a range of topics from higher education and immigration to policing and race relations. She is the author of several critically acclaimed books, including her most recent, which we will discuss, When Race Trumps Merit, How the Pursuit of Equity Sacrifices Excellent, Destroys Beauty, and Threatens Lives. Heather, a pleasure to have you on She Thinks. It's an honor to be with you, Beverly. Thank you for having me. And so I, I want to start with one of the most recent headlines that I have seen this week on crime, and that is Washington, D.C. has hit a grim milestone with the highest murder rate in two decades. Let's start with the nation's capital. What do you make of this, this data point and what does it say about where we are when it comes to crime? It's horrific, Beverly, and it's completely avoidable. This is all a result of the post-George Floyd breakdown in law enforcement uh, when we had leaders across the country embracing the idea that any law enforcement that has a disparate impact on black criminals is racist law enforcement and therefore we need to back off. If, if your viewers, Beverly, have been scratching their heads for the last three years as to why these progressive prosecutors are not prosecuting theft, shoplifting, resisting arrest, uh, turnstile jumping, and wondering what's going on. Why are police chiefs telling their police officers, don't make car stops, don't make pedestrian stops? Here's the answer. It's all about race. And this is something that most Americans don't want to talk about. It makes them very uncomfortable. But we have now embraced the idea that any law enforcement actions, however constitutional, however colorblind, that end up having a disparate impact on black criminals because the black crime rate is so high, we say that must be racist and ended. That's what's going on in Washington's capital. That's why people are being put back on the streets rather than incarcerated, because we want to avoid so-called mass incarceration of black criminals. But the fact of the matter is, when you back off of law enforcement, and again, this is a deliberate voluntary choice. It is a policy that has been consciously adopted. It's not an inevitability. When you back off on law enforcement because you want to protect black criminals, the victims are overwhelmingly going to be black, but they don't stay permanently black. Obviously, people are across Washington, D.C., across Minneapolis, across Chicago, are the victims of these drive-by shootings. Carjackings are also at an enormous high uh, in, in Washington, D.C. There's a 100% increase so far this year compared to 2022. You cannot understand anything that is going on in the criminal justice system today, Beverly, without being honest about race. And I want to go even before what happened with George Floyd. I want to go to President Trump in his administration. He put something forward before COVID that was for criminal justice reform. A lot of Republicans signed on to that. And I think that there is this overwhelming narrative or there, there was at that time saying we should not lock people up for decades for maybe smoking pot or marijuana. So do you distinguish between maybe somebody doesn't need to be incarcerated for as long as, as they are versus holding people accountable for things, yes, even things like car theft. So where, where, how should people look at that in its entirety? They should get the facts first, Beverly. Nobody, nobody is in prison for smoking pot. Prison remains what it has always been, a lifetime achievement award for persistence in criminal offending. You have to work very hard to get a big city DA interested in your case rather than pleading it out to, you know, home confinement, probation, uh, or parole. Uh, you, you really have to work hard to get yourself a prison sentence. 
Nobody is in there for sm smoking pot or for possessing a few joints. The people that are the, the, the very low number of prisoners nationally who are technically in prison for so-called drug possession, and that's about 4% of all prisoners, have all pled down from criminal, from drug trafficking. They've accepted a plea bargain. Uh, so this idea that we were in, in this blind hatred uh, of, of above all of minorities or this draconian frenzy, throwing people in prison willy nilly is simply wrong. And, and what I objected to the most with Trump signing uh, his criminal reform legislation was not tweaking here and there with, with mandatory minimum sentences because those are arbitrary to begin with. The real problem with what Trump did was that he did it in the name supposedly of racial justice. Trump strengthened this phony narrative that said that our criminal justice system is racist and he was gonna be the savior of blacks that was opportunistic, selfish, and deeply misinformed. And so when we look at some of the changes that have been made, even post COVID, um, you're talking about some of the theft in cities. Something that I've noticed is the increasing number of young men, if I can even call them men, I'm talking about boys in certain situations, the car theft really stands out, the looting stands out. Why are we seeing such an increase among young boys committing these types of crimes? Disparate impact. We've decided that we are not going to enforce the juvenile justice law because it has a disparate impact on, on black juveniles. Beverly, black juveniles in the post Floyd era are shot at 100 times the rate of white juveniles. Who's shooting them? Not the police, not whites, but other blacks. The crime rates are that disparate. Black males between the ages of 14 to 17 commit gun homicide at at least 10 times the rate of white and Hispanic males in that same age cohort. The idea that somehow uh, if, if black juveniles are more subject to criminal enforcement, it's because of racist prosecutors. No, it's not. The bodies do not lie. The shooting victims do not lie. This is because a breakdown of socialization in the black inner city, the family has fallen apart, bourgeois norms have fallen apart. These kids are not being given any form of self-control, deferred gratification. They're out there willy-nilly spraying bullets across sidewalks, not caring who they hit. Yes, the carjackings are insane because now there's no consequences because we have bought into the phony narrative that any law enforcement that has a disparate impact on black criminals, including black juvenile criminals, is per se racist and must be unwound. And just so that we have a more complete picture of what happens when you, let's say, a, a boy who commits some type of crime, he gets arrested, the cops take him in. What would have happened pre George, George Floyd era. And what happens now? Because I keep seeing more and more reports where somebody, some young boy commits a, a horrific crime and you find out that they have 12 priors. They've done this 12 times before. Why do they keep getting let out? What happened before versus what's happening now? Well, I don't want to draw too black and white a distinction, too mannequin distinction. It wasn't great before. Right. You know, the Obama administration, uh, was going after school discipline for having a disparate rate of discipline of black students, again, on this preposterous idea that there's no differences in behavior. But but again, if, if black males are committing gun homicide at at least 10 times the rate of white and Hispanic males, the idea that when they get in the classroom, they're, they're little angels of obedience and they're, and they're not insubordinate and not disrupting the class is absurd. The same breakdown of socialization that leads to those elevated rates of crime also leads to the elevated rates of of school infractions and the justice oh, Biden, uh, excuse me the Obama justice department was also going after the juvenile justice system because there too uh, a disproportionate number of juvenile delinquents are black and the only allowable explanation for that in our world today pre and post George Floyd is racism uh, so it was bad before, but it's gotten even worse 
post George Floyd as as the system just breaks down completely and you have progressive prosecutors uh, like in, in Alameda County, uh, Beverly Price, you know, again, saying she's basically <laughs> not enforcing uh, the, the criminal law against black juveniles. And, and it's so bad in Oakland now, it's, excuse me, her name is Pamela Price, not Beverly Price, um, that you had the local chapter in Oakland and Alameda County of the NAACP saying that price should be recalled because the crime rate and victimization rate had gone up so high in Oakland's predominantly black neighborhoods. And, and the Oakland NAACP was saying, basically Pamela Price is a racist because she doesn't care about the loss of black lives. And I'm curious what you hear from law enforcement. So obviously you talk to police officers. What is morale like, not just because there is this impression that they are these oppressive people who commit crimes against the public, especially um, those who are in the black community, but how discouraging is it for them where they probably say, see the same people over and over and over again that they're taking in, or maybe don't even have the authority to be able to take in if they commit a crime? What are you hearing from law enforcement? Yeah, I mean, nobody wants, it. there's a, a recruitment crisis in this country it's over. You cannot recruit in big cities because you will have the president of the United States, Joe Biden, routinely saying that black parents are right to fear that their children will be killed by a cop every time those child steps outside. That is so preposterously <clears throat> fictional, Beverly. It is outrageous that our president is spreading that kind of lie and the animosity that those lies breed in the streets for officers uh, when they're out there trying to make lawful arrests is very terrifying. The hostility, the resisting arrest goes up, which of course increases the chances that the officer himself will will feel compelled and, and legitimately so to increase his own use of, of force to gain compliance, which is his, his right to do. Uh, and yes, if you feel like what's the point of making these arrests because the guy's just back on the street, it's incredibly demoralizing. But But Police families are saying to everybody they know, whether it's their sons, nephews, grandchildren, don't go into policing. This is not uh, a, a profession that anybody has any future in. The Obviously, the, the railroading of Derek Chauvin, the fact that now any jury that is, is looking at a, a prosecution of a police officer basically is on notice that if, if they don't convict that police officer, there's going to be riots. This is the the threat, the, the uh, you know, a mafia type threat wielded in their cities. If you, if, we, if you don't give us this police officer scalp, we will burn you down. And, and the jury that convicted Derek Chauvin knew very well that if they didn't, you know, bring in a murder conviction, that not just Minneapolis, but the rest of the country would burn down. And I even want to talk about how that extends to civilians as well. One of the disturbing trends I think we've all seen is when you look at somebody being attacked on the street, usually it's in the metro or the subway or something like that, people will record versus getting involved. And we've seen examples where somebody, there is a, a, a good citizen who steps in and they're treated very poorly as well. Do you, do you find that there has been this ripple effect all across the board where people are afraid to intervene, help a woman who may be attacked? because they don't know what the repercussions will be like for them. Absolutely. I mean, here in New York, we're waiting for just one of the most heartrending travesties of justice, where you did have finally a chivalric male, a good Samaritan, who stepped in last year, or I guess, no, it was this year, uh, Daniel Penny in the New York City subways, a former Marine, to subdue a crazed homeless guy, Jordan Neely, who was obviously very high on drugs and was threatening the passengers. And he put him, he grabbed him and, and held him down on the floor. And Neely, who was high, uh, eventually did die uh, from, we don't, I'm not sure, you know, that we've even had the official autopsy report. Uh, but, but the Marine who subdued him, Daniel Penny, is now facing a murder conviction. This was a guy who bucked the system and said, no, it is important that I 
use my capacity to, to protect my fellow passengers. Because here in New York, you've had just a constant series of, of crazed criminal lunatics pushing people onto subway tracks, beating them up, sh stabbing them. It's and, and the police are not there. And so when civilians back off, there's simply no line of defense. So yes, it is very frightening. On the other hand, in one sense, it's kind of good to have the smartphone <laughs> videos as well sure. uh, to be able to counteract the media narrative, which will always be if it's a black victim uh, of a white Good Samaritan, of course, as the New York Times, you know, amplified day after day with the Daniel Penny, Jordan Neely case, uh, this was simply a, a, a white supremacist, uh, you know, beating up on a, a wonderful Michael Jordan impersonator. So, you know, the videos, the videos are important because they, they counteract this lie that, that uh, blacks are at risk of white supremacy, that Asians are at risk of white supremacy. Uh, here's the data, Beverly, on interracial violence. Uh, blacks commit 87% of all interracial violence between blacks and whites and whites and blacks. It's not blacks who are a threat from whites, it's whites who are a threat from blacks. A black is 35 times more likely to commit an act of violence against a white person than a white person is to commit an act of violence against a black person. And yet uh, the media and Joe, Joe Biden and the rest of the Democrats get away with this lie that it's whites who are threatening blacks. We've seen the videos, we've seen the videos of the looting. We've seen the videos of these frail elderly Asians getting knocked down in a game, the knockout game by these black teen thugs. And yet the country continues to live a lie that it is white supremacy that is the major threat of street violence. And I was hoping you could share some of the data as far as people who do live in black communities. Are, are they the ones going to city council meetings asking for the cities to do something about a police presence in their neighborhoods? Uh, I think the data does point to the fact that most black Americans want an increase in police presence and not a decrease, correct? Yes, it's 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 a complicated situation, Beverly. Uh, I've I've spent a lot of time in police community meetings in high crime inner city areas. And yes, absolutely. I have witnessed these good law abiding bourgeois people, especially the elderly women who just break your heart, who stand up and say, thank God for the police. They are my friends. And they beg for more police presence. They want the enforcement of truancy laws, of loitering laws, of drug possession laws, of marijuana smoking laws. They are absolutely hardline. They're the ones, you know, the, the so-called racist war on drugs has been initiated time and time again by the bourgeois elements in black communities. That having been said, uh, there is a disconnect because blacks continue to vote for anti-cop politicians, most infamously, most recently in Chicago when it was the South side and West sides of Chicago that, that voted most intensely for Brandon Johnson, uh, who was very anti-cop, a, a creature of the Chicago public school unions, uh, who's now gone around exculpating and making excuses for these black flash mobs that go rampaging down Michigan Avenue, uh, the Magnificent Mile in Chicago saying, oh, well, these kids are just economically deprived. They don't have opportunities, which is complete BS. These kids all have smartphones. Any kid that has a smartphone is not economically deprived. So there is, you know, whites kind of want to pretend that, well, it's just the white elites that are forcing these bad, these bad um, policies, you know, the usual whites blaming themselves. No, it is also uh, blacks who are putting in place these anti-cop politicians. I want to pick up on the example you just gave about these groups of men going down, committing various crimes. 
one of the things, and I'll just say this anecdotally because I lived in D.C. for over 20 years, um, I moved and during COVID due to the increased crime in my neighborhood, and I just knew it was getting worse, not better. But one of the things I've noticed as I go back to D.C. quite often is that crime or crime used to have certain rules. Yeah. There used to be if you walked only in, don't go to these neighborhoods. If you're a female, don't go in these neighborhoods alone at night, be with a group of people, but in the daytime, you're fine. But there's so many random acts of violence, whether that's people getting stabbed midday on a Sunday in a busy area. It, it seems like committing crime just to harm people versus somebody trying to get money. Um, it, it just seems like there aren't the same rules about crime that there used to be. Well, yeah, I think a lot of this is hate crime and we're not allowed to say it. You know, the only people, if you follow the the official discourse, the only people who commit hate crimes are whites. But I think a lot of these, the knockout game, when you have these teen thugs that are just coming up and, and, and clocking elderly whites or elderly Asians, there is a, definitely a racial animus involved in that. Uh, and, you know, human beings, there's, there's a will to power and a sadism that is implicit and latent in a lot of people. And if you know that you can get away with exercising brute force against others, some people will take advantage of that because it, it gives you a, a, a charge of, of power and, and of control. So we learned in the 1990s here in New York City it was received wisdom up until that point that police could not actually lower crime. They could only respond after the fact. And when we elected Mayor Giuliani, Rudolph Giuliani in 1994, he broke with that conventional wisdom and said, no, I'm actually going to lower crime. The police are going to do it. And they actually did. And they, they put into place the most unforeseen crime drop uh, in history. Uh, eventually crime dropped 85% in New York not because any root causes of crime changed, whether the left-wing root causes of racism and poverty and income inequality, or admittedly the conservative root causes of crime, which is family breakdown and illegitimate births. Those stayed the same. The only thing that changed was New York became very proactive in policing. So in that go ahead. Yeah, that leads to my question. So we, we've talked about the dismaying situation we see. You use an example of Rudy Giuliani, and that's what one of the things he's most known for as mayor of New York. Of course, 9-11 happened while he was mayor as well. But what is the hope for cities now? Do you see the tide changing at all where people have said that, for example, people selling homes and moving out of cities because they're fearful? Is there anything that's going to change this tide? The only thing that will change this tide is if we stop being victimized by the race hustle. That's it. We have to stop being worried about being called a racist. As long as we're scared of being called a racist, nothing is going to change. We have to confront head on the problems of black crime. And if we don't, and if we say that the only possible explanation for a disparate impact of policing is racism, nothing is going to change. Yes, there'll continue to be white flight from cities and a certain to a certain degree, uh, some black flight as well. Uh, but but we continue to go down this path. And I, you know, it hasn't changed. Everybody thought that 22 midterm elections, that crime was going to be the big issue. And it wasn't, you know, some some optimists said, oh no, it really did matter. No, it didn't. Uh, and and since then, I frankly, I have to admit, Beverly, I'm kind of dulled to it. Yeah, uh, it just gets worse and worse. And yet Americans turn their eyes away because they do not want to look at black dysfunction. It's the, the only thing that might happen right now. Uh, the victims of, of these insane drive by shootings are still predominantly black and Hispanic. The children are still overwhelmingly black. You know, you've had since George Floyd six-month-old toddler, black toddlers, one-year-old black children, six-year-old, nine-year-olds, 11-year-olds, their brains are getting blown out in these barbaric shootings committed by black juveniles and black thugs, adult thugs. 
if white kids start getting gunned down in these drive-by shootings, then there will be a revolution. Uh, but so far, it seems like nobody is willing to confront the breakdown of socialization that is driving this crime, and nobody is willing to say, we are going to respond with law enforcement. That is the lawful prerogative of any society. We should be worried about protecting the lawful, not about protecting the criminal. And I know we're running out of time, but I want to segue into your book called When Race Trumps Merit, because this book talks about racial disparities, giving an alternate explanation for why we have them. But I think what's so important in this book that I would like to have you comment on before we go is this this goes beyond crime. We are talking about every aspect of civilization. When racial disparities is the reason for everything, what does it do to those of us who think merit is an important aspect of society? Where is society headed if we don't look at this properly? We're headed towards, at best, mediocrity, and at worst, complete civilizational collapse. We keep putting uh, race ahead of merit in our decisions about whom to promote, whom to admit to medical school, whom to make doctors, whom to give research grants to, uh, we've decided that it's more important that a lab trying to solve Alzheimer's disease has a proportionate quota of black uh, neurologists or a lab trying to solve con cancer has a proportionate number of black oncologists, even if there are not a proportionate number of competitively qualified black doctors, physicians, scientists. We're, we're saying that, you know, traffic controllers, pilots should be chosen on the basis of race, not merit. The bridges are going to start falling down. We are going to have people victimized even more by medical malpractice than now. And white males are basically over. If you have sons or grandsons that are a heteronormative, as they say in campus, uh, white male, they are the last to be chosen they are going to be discriminated against in, in their admissions to graduate school, to law school, to medical school, to business school, to getting into law firms. It is complete. The game is stacked against them. Jewish white students, the same thing. Uh, and we, are, we have decided as a society that we would rather embrace mediocrity than embrace merit if that too has a disparate impact. Right now, Given the academic skills gap, Beverly, when you have 66% of black 12th graders not even possessing partial mastery of the most basic 12th grade math skills, such as doing arithmetic or reading a graph, it is absurd to say that the only allowable explanation for the lack of proportional blacks in meritocratic institutions, like in medical school, is racism. They're simply not in the pipeline. The academic skills gap is so great. And again, this is another fact that that good meaning white Americans, these so-called white supremacists turn their eyes away from. They would rather cop to a phony charge of, of racism than look at these problems head on. Well, there are so many narratives out there that counter what the research and the data actually show, which is why your book is such an important one. Again, that is called When Race Trumps Merit, How the Pursuit of Equity Sacrifices Excellent, Destroys Beauty, and Threatens Lives. Heather McDonald, not only a pleasure to have you on She Thinks, but thank you so much for your research on the area of crime. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Beverly. Good talking to you. And thank you all for joining us. Before you go, IWF does want you to know that we rely on the generosity of supporters like you. And investment in IWF fuels our efforts to enhance freedom, opportunity, and well-being for all Americans. So please consider making a small donation to IWF by visiting iwf.org backslash donate. That is iwf.org backslash donate. Last, if you should enjoyed this episode, do leave us a rating or review. It does help, and we'd love it if you shared this episode so your friends can know where they can find more She Thinks. From all of us here at IWF, Thanks for watching.